My name is Louise Vandenberg and I'm a media honors student at the University of Cape Town. I was inspired to make this documentary because my older sister has Down syndrome and growing up I didn't really feel like I had the support that I needed. I didn't have friends that could relate to my situation and I felt very much isolated in my experience at times and by making this documentary I really hope to create a resource of support for other siblings that find themselves in the same situation as me. My name is Shalom Kasongandaya, I'm 17 years old, a grade 11 student at Berkeley High School and I originally am from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I've been in South Africa for more than 16 years and I'm a sibling of a brother who has um, autism and he's been autistic since birth. Hi, my name is Hannah Kabatz. Um, I'm currently a third year physiotherapy student at GWC and my brother has Williams syndrome, which is a quite a rare disability. It's a deletion of oh, the chromosome number seven. <laughs> My name's Julia, um, I'm in the art industry, I'm the exhibition manager at Sides Marker Museum and yeah, we share a brother, Matthew. <laughs> so i um, Ethan Slammett, um, 22 years old, uh, currently studying at uh, UCT, uh, Information Systems in my third year. So my sister Erin, she first when she was born she had epilepsy but then through seizures that kind of like developed into cerebral palsy and then through that she became quadriplegic. So my name is Shandy Sarantos and I'm 20 years old. I'm a starving musician and my brother has autism. I feel like forming an identity definitely came from him because he's my twin, but also I feel like people forget that he's the silent teacher because obviously I'm the neurotypical sibling. So everyone expects me to be his biggest teacher, but I find that with his like purity of mind and his ability to be able to not really worry about social norms. I never saw any difference in him until people started reacting negatively or positively and kind of going, oh, well, he's different. And then I started realizing that not everyone's going to accept him and see him the way I do. My relationship with my brother has definitely improved and worsened over time because I think when we were kids, no one really worried about what his future would look like. So, and he couldn't talk till he was 11. So it was kind of about how I could make him laugh and how to spend time and create games around us communicating. And then I think as he started talking, obviously you get things like sibling rivalry. Um, but I feel like over time, it doesn't worsen because of our relationship. But I think sometimes I definitely feel guilty for growing up and having my own life because when you're younger, I think there's so much time spent in the saddle, learning about each other and having time to just be kids. But then as you grow up, I think it's also the question of where should he be going, you know, after high school. And there isn't a lot of facility in South Africa that caters for that. So it's all these questions of he becomes a lot of a responsibility and a brother. So sometimes that can also become a parental dynamic and that can take away from sibling rivalry but I think ultimately, as he's learned to talk, I've been able to understand him better. So it's also improved over time. Before my brother could talk, I needed to find repetitive ways to make him laugh. So there would be a window outside the house and he could see in through the window into our you know, little room. And then I'd run around and he'd see me running and then I'd scare him. I'd be like, ah, and then I'd, he'd laugh and then I'd come back and he'd watch me and we'd play these little cat and dog type games. But it was cool because I almost had to work out how to entertain myself and also him. He really loves repetition. So if you play him a video over and over or a song, that's kind of how I navigated making him laugh before he could talk. Should we start again? Look 
in my spare time, actually, no, no, that's a lie. In all my time, my hobby is music. So what's cool is that my brother and I have been able to connect through music and it's also my full-time job. So that's definitely always been a de-stressor for both of us when there's conflict and I can't quite explain to him how we're going to resolve it or what's going on. You know, music's kind of always been the thing to bring him down and center us both. responsibilities that you've had to take on or you know will have to take on in the future yeah so with erin there does come a lot of roles uh because of how she is she does have like a pig or tube in her, her body because she can't obviously chew and like eat processed food so in terms of feeding her it is something that i've had to adapt because when i was younger my parents would obviously do all the feeding and if she coughs you need to like suction her through a trackie so when my parents maybe are away and I'm babysitting, I would have to, you know, feed her or if my dad's away, I'll take my mom, like carry her to the bed or, you know, if we're going out, put her in the van in a wheelchair. And so, yeah, like feeding, suctioning, helping with like medication sort of thing. So these are like roles that I've like, I'm like accustomed to basically. There was frequent like hospital visits with Erin because obviously she does need like extensive care and frequent like doctor checkups. So when I was in like primary school, you know, it, it is like, why are we going to the hospital so much? Like, what's going on? And not really fully understanding, because obviously I don't think my parents at the time would have that sort of conversation with me when I'm literally in like grade three or four or whatever. So that, that stood out to me, just like constant hospital visits. And then also just seizures in general is something that uh, I've had to come to terms with. But at the start, it was really like, whoa, what's going on? Like, it was kind of a freaky like situation for me. It is difficult to connect with Erin per se because for me personally, I think for making a connection, I kind of do need like reciprocal actions and she can't obviously respond to everything I say and like move. So in terms of that, it is challenging. If maybe she's having a seizure, I'd like try and calm her down or like, you know, like just like see if everything's okay. But other than that, it is kind of challenging to form a relationship that doesn't really reciprocate back to me. So yeah, my family is very like, sporty so we're very like sport fanatic so uh, i play a lot of soccer baseball that really is like my main hobby in, in terms of like freeing my mind so growing up it wasn't really that difficult but um in terms of my relationships with my friends it did really affect that because uh, i would often be reluctant to introduce it to my sister because i would often like worry if maybe they were uncomfortable with her or how they if they actually understand how I'd have to be with her when they're around because she obviously needs extensive care and like if that would affect my relationship with my friend I didn't really want to like you know almost start that so that was something that I was really reluctant about. So my relationship with Erin has definitely improved over time uh, when I was younger, I was quite ignorant as obviously when I was like three, I obviously thought she was just a normal baby because, you know, going through that sort of thing, I didn't really understand anything that was going on. But as I grew older, you know, I gained a more understanding, uh, obviously gained more responsibilities and that definitely in turn improved our relationship because I obviously have to now care for her, do more things for her and uh, that's sort of how me and her like related and formed a relationship sort of way. I did have to come to terms with the fact that my parents did have to put Erin's you know, needs and wants first before mine and at a young age that did uh, affect me quite a bit, it was quite problematic but as I grew older I gained a more understanding and you know, uh, come to terms with those situations so that, that, that was a learning curve for me, a very big learning curve. I did have to grow up uh, fairly quickly and you know, come to terms with that I wasn't really bothered at the time but 
uh, I did realize that okay, uh, Aaron has to be put first. Therefore, you know, uh, this is how it has to be. So there's nothing really that I can do about it. All my parents can do about it. I mean, the public just stare. Uh, if we can call the public exposure, but we're very careful about who we expose, and only. In certain points of our friendships or relationships do we actually introduce them to Matthew. It's sort of like slowly integrating them um, as a way for both of them to feel comfortable, like mm. the friend and Matthew. Um, but we don't necessarily just, you know, introduce Matthew to everyone. It's very stressful for him. It's stressful for us as well because unfortunately he speaks his mind. So if he doesn't like you, <laughs> he pretty much will tell you to your face. Um, extremely protective over him. Uh, don't mess with him. Don't even look at him badly. <laughs> yeah, I remember as a kid, If I mean, not a young kid, but I remember when I was younger, if a kid would stare at Matthew, I'd stare right back at them. Matthew had a lot of medical issues, so he spent many days and hours in the hospital with him. So I think for me, it was more the medical issues that were the problems growing up, and not so much the disability side for me. You know, I find myself taking the role of the carer for everyone. It's like I've learned to really care for people and their needs more so than myself. Um, yeah, so take him to like doctor's appointments, make sure he has his medication. Um, he's not feeling well come to me. Yeah. I think, you know, he's forever going to be dependent on someone from our family. Mm. So definitely in the future, you know, Hannah and I will have to sort of, you know, take the place of our parents one day when they move on. So, yeah, I think we'll always be involved in his, in his life. I definitely don't lean on my friends for support with Matthew. Um, it's almost impossible for someone who doesn't have a disabled sibling to understand. Mm. And often, you know, it's people feel very awkward talking about it. I feel like to a large extent, it's taboo. Like when you say to someone, I have a disabled brother, they're like, oh, shame. And I'm like, there's nothing to be sorry for. They are who they are. They're not yeah. dying. Um, and people, you can see people are automatically uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So definitely we rely within our family mm -hmm. for that support, more so than our friends. Um, concerning my, my um, surroundings, I would say, um, reaction to my brother, I would say it's a mainly negative reactions. People don't, um, I don't know really, but I would say it's their fault. Because if we um, observe the media today, um, disability is it's not really being ma it's not really being made aware as much as it should be. Most people are not aware of this. But as I'm so grateful to technology, but as the years are progressing, people are becoming more aware of disabilities, and it's really been spoken about more openly in schools, which actually makes people more aware about it. But it still does not remove the fact that people are not aware to the extent that they should be aware, and therefore I have experienced I have experienced people um, looking at looking down upon my brother, undermining him. And I have seen lots of parents as well, like sometimes in public transport, my brother wants to move around or he wants to get out and he does, he cannot speak and say, excuse me. So many people take offense to that without actually realizing that perhaps he might have not said excuse me because he doesn't know how to say it. But I know my brother very well, he's a very polite and a kind person. But other people don't see him that way because they don't understand who he is and exactly what he, his needs are. So. It therefore does instigate negative feedback. Personal setbacks I've had to overcome, I would say first on my list would be guilt. Growing up, even though I have a very, um, I would say, strong connection with my brother, very profound one as well, um, when I was younger, I did not necessarily comprehend my brother and his needs. And so did, the, so did my friends. And therefore they would treat my brother very rudely, unkindly, and I would allow them to. And when I, when I um, reflect on my life and I really do regret like letting them treat him the way they did um, so I would say a personal setback would be guilt I really feel guilty for allowing people to undermine my brother I feel guilty for allowing people to hit on him or to bully him and yes I really I really do feel guilty about that and I try my best to repair that in particular memories I would say every day is a beautiful memory for me every day is um, a journey it's a beautiful ride on this journey that we are together and um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a particular memory but I would say I'm just proud of how I've become less embarrassed about my brother 
and I'm open about the fact that my brother is autistic and I no longer feel embarrassed about it and how I actually stand up to people who want to bully him or want to be unkind to him and how I'm just ready to stand up for him and stand up for any other disabled person and actually assist people in becoming more comprehensive because I notice a lot of children in high schools actually find it funny that people are autistic or people are uh, Down syndrome and but I actually have, assist, have assisted my friends and my peers in understanding that it's not funny but we should actually be there to assist them and not actually point fingers at them. Yes, there have been financial uh, conflicts or financial constraints, especially when my brother began um, special school. His school fees was quite out of our reach as a family and so it was quite difficult to meet the financial um, needs and there are so many different fundraisers or different sorts of support that the school um, requests for from the parents and therefore it was very difficult to um, to meet those needs and it really did affect us as a family and until my, the school was kind enough to offer um, exemption of fees for my brother therefore assisting him in actually being able to um, study well and to have um, access to all the all that the school has to offer but at the beginning it was very difficult because my um, parents were not able to um, meet the financial needs of my brother at that stage. What is something that you wish the world knew about your disabled sibling? This is my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say Nathan is not annoying. He's not um, non-comprehending or he's not irritating. But he's just a beautiful... Um, beautiful, kind, compassionate and loving person who just expresses himself in different ways. And he's a person, like I always say, if eternity would be revoked, I would choose to be his sister with open arms. He's a beautiful person, a person who puts others first and he always assists me in being a good person because I see how much he does. My brother actually does almost all the chores in my house. He does what I should be doing. <laughs> He assists me in different ways. He packs my bags for me. He sees me off. He's so excited to see me when my mom comes to collect me from school. He hugs me. He kisses me. And I would just want the world to know that he's a loving person. He cares for others. He puts others first. And he shares what he has with other people. And that he's not the irritating or the non-comprehending person that society tends to think that disabled people are. But all he needs is love and support. The love and the support that he gives to others. And I just wish that the world would give it back to him. Something I'd want the world to know about my sibling, my disabled sibling, is just how capable he is and how incredible he is and just how amazing his view on the world is. Mm. It is so unique and, you know, one day I wish I could go inside his head and just understand everything from his perspective. It's so innocent. It's so wholesome for the most part. Um, <laughs> because, you know, he, he always sort of holds on to our negativity. Yeah. And he echoes those. Um, and I'd also like the world to know to treat him as a person, yeah. as a human being, and to look past the disability and see a human form, a human mind, a human heart, and not just disability. Um, and to look past, you know, the, the sort of facial characteristics and just how different he looks, and for people to be sympathetic, but not make him feel incapable. Inca yeah. Um, yeah. For the world to know that there is more people like her, I'm not the only one. And that her personally, I do think that she is strong, like she has overcome a lot of things and gone through a lot. So yeah, just that she is like a strong person and it really has like strengthened our family's relationship and our family's bond. I want the world to know that autism, all disabilities, every single frame, it's not that they're disabled, they're just specially abled. And I think that people should be willing to put down you know, their little list of things that they know and big list and be able to go, what can I learn from them rather than what can we learn just from our own experience? And I wish that people knew how sassy he was behind the scenes and how much humor he has just in being silent. I think I've always spoken a lot because I've had to fill the space, you know, that he couldn't with words, but I think he teaches me so much more with just being. And I would love people to be able to take a chance to just quiet, I need to quiet down myself and just learn from him living. Can we see? Can we see the picture? Can we see the picture? Hide it!